One, two. Good morning. Thank you. Just a little bit of hush now, please. Thank you very much. I just want to start by uh, letting some embarrassing somebody really because a little bird just told me, Jenny, it's your birthday tomorrow. So you know who to thank. You know who to thank, but have a lovely day tomorrow and uh, bless you on your birthday. Well, let me welcome you. My name is Gordon. I'm the pastor here. And I can look around the room as I can do most Sundays and see that we've got new people here, which is great. If you're here for the first time, let me give you a very special welcome. Um, I'm so glad that you've chosen to come and be with us this morning. And uh, if, if you're used to being in church, you might recognize what a service is like. If you're not used to being in church, don't worry. The person next to you will keep you right. But we're not here to embarrass anyone or ask you to do anything weird. We just want you to enjoy the service as we think about God's love together. We'll sing some songs. You'll hear some prayers. Uh, In a while, I will uh, teach something from God's Word, the Bible. Um, But we won't do anything that makes you feel uncomfortable. At the end, just to reward you for your patience, there's tea and coffee and biscuits. So we do encourage you to stay for that. If you are visiting and you want to get to know the church a little bit or there's something you want to ask a question about, as you leave where Bill is standing, Bill's the gentleman with the red t-shirt on, yeah, Bill's holding up one of these little purple welcome cards. On the back you've got an opportunity just to fill in your details. Leave it uh, on the table where Bill is and we'll uh, get in touch with you if that's what you would like. There's a number of things that you can inquire about. Or if you just want to meet up over a coffee and have a chat, that would be lovely too. This morning, as we get started, I just want to read this uh, call to worship while Archie... Nah, keep him away from the wires. <laughs> That's fine. Later on in the service, we're going to be thinking about doubts. And um, we all have doubts, I'm sure, from time to time about different things. And the passage that we'll look at is in John chapter 20 later on. And the, the call to worship this morning and... The prayer that I'm going to lead us in are both uh, based on that, and we'll come to that in a moment or two. Let me just run through, though, some church news, because it's always good to do that and uh, make sure that you hear anything that's important to you. Um, I'm not going to mention all the people who are unwell today, because later on in the service, Gwyn is going to be praying, and uh, we'll pray for people who are perhaps going through tough times. But this week in the life of KBC, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, there's a meeting for all the core team leaders, all the ministry team leaders, as well as the trustees, and that's at 7 o'clock here in the church. Later in the week, on Thursday, which is a busy day, on Thursday at 12 o'clock, the Mana Cafe reopens, uh, which is exciting, but do pray for uh, Jill and Jeff and the rest of the team as that gets going again, and pray that the the community will uh, know about it and that they will come back. Uh, to not just receive a lovely meal, but to share some friendship as well. Also on Thursday, after the cafe, the Crafter Nooners, which uh, are people that do craft in an afternoon, in case you hadn't worked that out, uh, come along. And you're more than welcome, if that's you, if you're interested in doing crafts, just turn up, you'll be made most welcome. Thursday evening, we have our prayer time, which is again on Zoom this week, and that will be led by Richard and Joan Hardway. Next Sunday... The speaker next Sunday is our very own Gwyn Parry. And a week on Tuesday, on the 17th, is our BBC meeting. Morning, Dan. Good to see you. <laughs> and uh, our BBC meeting is our Bible business and coffee evening. And you don't have to be a member, but if you've got any interest in the life of KBC and what's happening in the church, that's a week on Tuesday. That's the 17th. Next Saturday night... Um, There is uh, one of the regular Songs of Redemption events, which is taking place this month at the URC Church in Roussan-Sea at 7 o'clock. I believe there's a poster somewhere in the building. Um, If you want more details, make it your quest to find the poster today. Um, At the end of each Sunday service, we encourage people that if anything happens in the service or if there's anything going on in your life that you would value some prayer for, then at the end of the service, just simply make your way over to where it says prayer zone, surprisingly enough, and uh, there'll be people from the church there ready, willing to hear you, to listen to you, to pray with you, and to help you, we hope. Um, We would appeal for some fit people at the end this morning. 
This room needs to be reset for the cafe later in the week, so we value you uh, moving chairs and tables and so on. And I think Rob is pretty good at coordinating that, so if you want to be part of that, just ask Rob what needs doing. Just about finished the notices. The only other thing is you would see on the way in, there's a table with loads of books on. I had a bit of a clear out, and uh, I've got some books. Ali used to tell me if you buy a book, get rid of a book. So I'm trying to be faithful to that. So there's a, a table there. They're just free. Take one if you think it would be helpful. Take more than one if you want to and give them away as well. Let's just quieten our hearts, shall we? This is the message I have heard from him and now celebrate with you. Christ is risen. Blessed are you who have not seen him, yet you truly believe and trust him. See how good and delightful it is when Christians gather together as one. The Lord has commanded a great blessing, life forevermore. Let's pray together. Our loving Father God, you are indeed astounding. At the end of all your surprises, you send among us the one who was crucified, dead and buried, and risen into glory. He comes today amongst us as a living Lord, defying our locked doors, banishing our fears, greeting us with peace, and overwhelming us with awe and wondering love. How blessed are those who believe him. How happy are those who receive him. Lord God Almighty, please receive our thanks, our praise, and our worship today. Continue to bless us beyond our deserving as we lift our voices in celebration in the name of the same Christ Jesus, whose presence makes this occasion. Amen. If you're able, would you please stand?
to take a seat. Um, in a moment, the children are going to leave and we will be taking an offering. Um, but let's just pray for the children before they go. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the children and the young people that we have here today. And Lord, we thank you for the blessing of having them and the privilege of being able to share your word and your love with them. Lord, I pray for the leaders as they go out that you would be with them, that you would give them the words from you, Lord, to express in ways that the children can understand about your love. Lord, we pray that you would open their hearts and their eyes to who you are. For those that already know you, we pray that they would continue to grow and that you would protect them. And for those that don't know you, let Lord, we just pray that you would just be with them, that you would just speak so deeply into their hearts and bring changes to them. We ask for your protection over them now as they go upstairs and that you would just be with them all. In Jesus' name, amen. Morning, everyone. Morning. Let's come to pray today. What do you think about when you come to pray? Let me just read some scriptures from Esther chapter 5. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall facing the entrance. And when he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Then the king asked, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Sounds actually quite scary, doesn't it? Going before the king. The scepter, the sign of authority, sovereign authority, passed from heaven to earth. The king with his royal scepter. When we come to the courts of King Jesus in heaven. He is the royal scepter. The cross is the royal scepter. We are accepted completely and totally in the presence of an almighty God. Hallelujah. He is the omnipotent God who can do all things, who knows all things, and can change anything. So this morning, as we come to pray... We don't come with fear. We come with excitement and expectation. I'm going to lead us in prayer. And I want you to notice that Esther brought one thing. Just one thing. Each of us will have more than one thing on our mind this morning. But I just want you to home in on one thing. That you want to see change and it seems impossible but the God of the ages is able to do more than all we ask or imagine hallelujah Christ is enough let's pray together let's just bow our heads close our eyes and let's just be quiet before the Lord what is your one thing your one request Oh, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, thank you that you invite us to come into the courts of heaven and lay our requests at your feet. Lord, thank you that you are the all-powerful God and your word tells us that nothing is impossible with you. So majestic one, we come before your throne and we ask you one thing. Okay, you ask the Lord in your heart that one thing. Father, we want to say thank you for church. We want to say thank you that you said in your word that you're going to build your church and the church in the gates of hell 
will not stand against it, will not prevail against it. Heavenly Father, thank you for our local church here in Kimmel Bay. Lord, we pray for our pastor, Gordon and Ali. And we pray for our core leadership team and our ministry team leaders and our trustees and all who serve the community in this place. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that you would bless us as we seek to hold out the word of life. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling at this time. Pray for those recently bereaved. Pray for those in hospital, and we particularly mention June to you. We mention Gwen before your throne. A little Mabon. We mention Mabon before you and ask this young lad, pray for his mum and dad, Stefan and Heleth, Andras and Heleth. Lord, be with them. Watch over them. Keep them safe, Lord. Bring healing into that situation. Pray for Ernie and Jean. Lord, there are many needs, and we bring them before your throne. We thank you that you are enough, and we thank you that you answer our prayers in accordance with your plan and your purposes, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
do take your seats. Thanks to Karen and the band for leading us so beautifully in our sung worship this morning. When I sing that song, I, I, I get a picture in my mind of, you know when you're driving and your windscreen is filthy and you don't notice it on a day like today, but on a sunny day, when the sun shines, it picks out all the flaws and all the muck and all the debris on your windscreen, doesn't it? You think, oh, I've been driving around with a really filthy windscreen. When we're exposed to the sun, S-O-N, the Lord Jesus, all of those things that we just sung about in the world, they grow strangely dim, but also they are highlighted by the purity and the brightness and the brilliance of Christ to the point where we realize, actually, I've been driving around. I've been living my life with that mess all the time. I've been oblivious to it at times, but when you're exposed to the light of Christ, it shows up and you notice. And then you are confronted with the thought, what am I going to do about it? Well, welcome to KBC once again. If you're visiting with us, it's a joy to have you with us. I don't know whether it's you being here and visiting, but the singing was exceptional today. Maybe, maybe we've got a visitor who's a really good singer and it's just lifting us all. <laughs> Fantastic. I did notice, though, when I looked at the band up here, I did go back a week in my thinking. You remember last week we had the youth band? I think probably if you took the average age of the youth band last week, it probably started with a number one. Maybe two if you add Matt in, who was leading with them. I, I'm not even going to hazard a guess <laughs> this week what the number is that we're starting with. But it's not about age, is it? It's about gifting and sincerity, authentic worshippers, those with clean hands and pure hearts. So it's good to, good to worship God together, I'm sure you agree. I want to talk for a moment as I get going this morning about nicknames. Nicknames are usually given affectionately in a circle of friends. They're normally, normally they're related to a characteristic or an incident, some shared history within the group. And so a nickname can be a humorous way of remembering an event. Now I'm sure in the room this morning, if we had time, we could hear some very amusing nicknames, maybe even some embarrassing ones. I can remember being given three nicknames during my life, all of them really during my school days. Now, I realize that I'm taking my life in my hands, sharing them with some of you jokers here uh, in the church this morning. The first one, on, an, on one occasion, I bought a new pair of trainers. Let's be more truthful. A new pair of trainers was bought for me <laughs> right? I was young. Now, they weren't the coolest, most bang up-to-date trainers but they were what my mum could afford. And I do remember they were dead comfy, which is not to be underestimated in footwear. And as a teenager, I had had 16 operations on my feet. And so comfortable footwear was essential. However, these trainers had a rather unfortunate name. They were called, wait for it, Boofers. <laughs> Boofers which some of my pals seem to find hilarious for no particular reason. So for a period of some months, I was called Boofer. <laughs> Fortunately, it didn't stick, and the novelty wore off. Please don't go back to those days, KBC. <laughs> Another time, we were doing PE in the school, and we were doing the hurdles on the athletics track. Now, you may have realized I wasn't particularly built for speed. Um, apparently, whenever I jumped the hurdles... This is what people saw. My arms went out at the side, um, resembling, according to my so-called friends, resembling a seal. <laughs> and so another name was birthed for that group of friends. I was seal for a few weeks. We had moved on from buffer, and I was now seal. Now, that one didn't stick either, and that was as short-lived as my Olympic prospects as a hurdler, <laughs> um, I have to say. The other one, which did hang around was weirdo. <laughs> now, let me just say for the benefit of visitors, my surname is Weir, W-E-I-R. So I'm hoping that that nickname was on account of my, nick, my surname, not for any other reasons. My father was called Robert. He got called at the factory where he worked. He was called Weary Bob. My brother, Craig, who had a beard, was called Beardy Weirdy. 
Now, sometimes nicknames are funny and you're all laughing and you're all making a mental note about those three. And I've no doubt I will hear all three of them at some point again. But nicknames sometimes become more significant. And they can partly define a person in the minds of others. Now, this is true in the person that we're thinking about today. When we think about a man in the Bible called Thomas... We cannot help of thinking of Thomas without thinking of his nickname because he's universally known as Doubting Thomas. Now, if you don't know why, don't worry. We're now going to explore together the occasion that gave him the nickname Doubting Thomas. So we're going to read from God's Word in John's Gospel, chapter 20. If you don't have a Bible of your own and you would like one, just please raise your hand and hold it up. Bill will race to bring you one. It will also have the the words on the screen, but I think it's always preferable to have a Bible in front of you and uh, reading together as we go through them. So keep your hands up where Bill can see you if you want a Bible. And don't worry, um, if you don't, we can still see it on the screen, I hope, although it might be a bit small, but never mind, we'll do our best. So we're going to read in John's Gospel. If you're not sure where John's Gospel is, nudge the person next to you and ask them to help you. And they'll find it with you so that we're all literally on the same page. Okay, so we're going to read from John chapter 20, verse 19. And it says there, So, when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they've been retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Jesus came and the doors having been shut... Jesus came and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger. See my hands. Reach here your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you've seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Put a little bookmark or your thumb or something in there and uh, have that handy and we'll come back to that. Now, the first thing I hope you realize as we read about Thomas, dear old doubting Thomas, is that he actually already had a nickname called Didymus. I was young. I thought that meant he was a tiny, toty wee guy, a wee diddy man. But no, it means twin. So he had a twin. And three times in his gospel, John writes about Thomas, and every time he introduces him as Thomas, also called Didymus. Here's Thomas like me, he's collecting uh, nicknames, like people collect stamps. But this morning, I I don't want to consider just the nickname which has stuck, the one that you all know, Doubting Thomas. I also want to suggest another couple of possibilities which might be appropriate for this disciple of Jesus. So let's begin by just rewinding a few days. Jesus had gathered his disciples in the upstairs room of a house and they shared supper together. Nothing unusual about that, right? Friends eat together all the time. What marked it out as different was that this would be the final meal that they shared together before Jesus died on the cross. Only one person in the room knew, mind you, that that was going to be their final meal together and that person was Jesus himself. For the last three years or so, they had been a band of brothers walking from place to place, seeing Jesus doing many, many miracles, being taught by Jesus that they too could do 
amazing things for the kingdom of God. And whether they realized it or not, they had been fast-tracked onto a three-year apprenticeship program with the Son of God. But he was about to leave them. And he was trying to equip them and make, make sure they bless you, make sure that they knew that they were equipped to do the job after he had gone, after he had died and risen again. So after this meal, Jesus led them out to a little garden called Gethsemane. It was a place that they knew well. And while they were there, Jesus just became overwhelmed with the reality of what was about to happen, what was about to happen to him at the cross. He knew that his death on the cross was literally just round the corner. The crucifixion was not an unknown quantity. They would have witnessed many crucifixions carried out by their oppressive Roman masters. But Jesus knew that his crucifixion was going to be unique. He knew that on the cross, he wasn't going to be punished and put to death for things that he had done wrong. Because he hadn't done anything wrong. The thing that made his death on the cross unique was that he was going to be punished for everybody else's sin in the whole of eternity. Which means that that includes yours and mine. That's what the cross was about. And so Jesus knew that on the cross he would be completely alone. Forsaken even by his father, God. He would be abandoned to an experience known only to those in hell itself. Father God, his loving Father God, would unleash an eternity's worth of wrath and torture on his body, on his soul. Romans chapter 6 in the New Testament tells us that the wages of sin is death. And Jesus was about to pay the price for all of us. No wonder in this garden scene his heart is heavy and he's overwhelmed. No wonder then he wanted his closest friends all around him. But even as they were there, a man called Judas, who had been part of Jesus' group of disciples, one of the 12 men marked out by Jesus, well, he appears with his paymasters. And as arranged, he sidles up to Jesus and gives the game away by kissing Jesus on the cheek. That was the signal, you see. And so the Roman soldiers immediately swoop. Jesus is arrested and he's taken away after a short skirmish involving Peter and a sword and a disembodied ear and an on-the-spot healing by Jesus, followed by a swift rebuke to Peter. But in very quick order, Jesus is arrested. He's tried. He's convicted. He's beaten up. And then he's put on a wooden cross and he's crucified and killed what then of his followers? Are they loyal? Do they hang around? Not a bit of it. They scatter. And with the apparent exception of Peter and John, in fear they go into hideout mode. And it seems that they remain there over the weekend. The death of Jesus was on Friday. But they're still there on Sunday. The dream seems to be over. Their leader is dead. The Romans have got their man. And now they're going to be gunning for the disciples. Determined to stamp out this new movement. And so these disciples are unexpectedly, perhaps naturally, distraught. All this talk of Jesus building his kingdom. And now it seems that it's going to come to nothing. And so it's Sunday evening. And the disciples have gathered together. Not the twelve... Because remember, or maybe you didn't know this, but by this stage, Judas, the man who betrayed Jesus, he's gone out and killed himself. Because he's been overcome by his own actions and what he's done. It's not even the eleven, because as we've just read and discovered, Thomas was absent. So let's say that there were ten of them there, which we think that's right. Now maybe they had gathered together to gain strength by being together. There's strength in numbers, right? Maybe just to establish, as they do the head count, that they're all okay, they're all unharmed. But there was one topic of conversation that had their interest. You see, there was a rumor, started by some of the women, that Jesus was alive again. That they had seen him. 
and that he had risen from the dead. There was no body in the tomb when they went there earlier. In fact, that he told them to gather together that he would soon see them. That was the message. Some of them had even been to the tomb to investigate for themselves. And true enough, there was no sign of Jesus' dead body. Only the grave clothes that he had been laid in. And then, amazingly, unbelievably, Jesus appears right in front of them. And he shows them the marks on his body, the marks of crucifixion. And they're both astounded and overjoyed. Jesus is alive. And their fears are immediately forgotten as they recognize that their friend, their master, Jesus, is back from the dead. How are you feeling at that point if you're in that room? Their jaws drop. Their eyes pop as their brains begin to compute what this means. But, but, there's no sign of our friend Thomas. So here's my first suggestion for a new nickname for Thomas. I'm going to call him, first of all this morning, Absent Thomas. This scene of amazement and wonder that the ten disciples experience gives us a vital lesson for our lives even here today in Kimmel Bay in 2024. You see, the group had gathered together. And as they gathered together, God in the person of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, showed up. When God's people gather together, God is there. Jesus himself says in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18 and verse 20, for where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there, in their midst. But here's the catch. If you're not there, You won't experience it. When you're absent, as Thomas was, you run the risk of missing out on the blessing of God's presence being with God's people. And I want you to think about that and apply that to church life for a moment. Think for a moment what it would be like if we all came to every gathering of KBC in the course of a month. The monthly calendar of church life. And you all came to everything with the certain hope and belief that God was going to be present. Really think about that. Would you take the chance to miss out on an encounter with God? Because when we grasp that, our experience of church, our spiritual lives, our family lives, our desire to serve God with our lives will be completely transformed. When we realize that Jesus' promise is reality, that he has promised his presence together when we gather in his name, then our faith goes off the charts. Would you want to take the chance of missing out on God's blessing and God's presence? Here's a tough question for us this morning, and I'm asking myself it as well as you. Why don't we live like that? Why don't we bring that sense of expectation and excitement? Why are we so easily distracted and dissuaded from meeting together? We know the verse in Hebrews 10, let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. I'll ask you gently this morning, how do we encourage one another if we're not here? Maybe you're sitting watching at home today and you're not here. Maybe you've got very good reasons why you're not here. We're not talking about, you know, if you're not well enough to be here, you're working today. But we can all, all of us in the room today, I'm sure, as well as folks at home, we can all think of uh, the, the division there is between reasons and excuses. Two very different things, aren't they? Oh, pastor, you're laying it on thick today. I am, but I've got a week's holiday coming up in a few weeks. So. <laughs> but you get the point. If you're not here, you miss out. Or you might do. And I'm not saying, please hear me on this church, I'm not saying that God is not with us when we're alone. He is, of course. But there's something unique, there's something amazing about being with fellow Christians worshipping God together, isn't there? 
There's an added dynamic in corporate worship which we don't get by being on our own or separating ourselves off. I've lost count over the years, the number of people I've met who tell me that they can follow the Bible and be a Christian without going to church or being a part of a fellowship of believers. And I've got to tell you folks, I just don't see it. Not according to the Bible. And when we get to heaven, which we will one day if we've trusted Jesus, we'll be in it together, worshipping with all of creation. So let's get into the habit while we are down here. Because when we are together, we experience the breadth of the body of Christ. We share our lives and our faith stories together. We grow by supporting one another in the same way that a body is built together with each limb and muscle being connected for the common good. And we enjoy camaraderie and friendship and fellowship, encouragement from God's people, fun together. Yes, you're allowed to have fun in church. We explore God's word together. We explore God's presence together. And we enjoy it, don't we? And we share in one another's joys, but also in each other's sorrows. Sometimes you'll be the one in need of support or encouragement. Other times you will be the one providing the support and encouragement. That's what it is to be a fellowship, a body, a family. And when we gather together, something is added both to ourselves and to the wider group. And so when we are missing, the opposite is true. Give me another tough question. Do we actually believe Jesus when he says that he will be right in the midst when we gather together in his name? Because if we do, then we are displaying evidence that we actually believe he's alive. That's the definition of a Christian, a follower of the risen Lord Jesus. And if we do, then what should that mean for our lives, for our faith, for our church? This is an exciting time to be a part of Kinmo Bay Church. In fact, I've been here two and a half years. I don't remember there not being an exciting time to be part of Kinmo Bay Church. But there's lots of good things happening. We're seeing people becoming Christians. We're seeing people about to be baptized. Stand up if you're getting baptized at the end of this month. Don't be shy. Thank you, guys. That's exciting. Can you just remember those faces of the people that stood up and prayed for them in the next two or three weeks? Because I've no doubt that the devil's not happy about that. And he'll be trying to make trouble for them. And some of you might have been even experiencing that since you decided to get baptized. The devil doesn't want you to be living your best Christian life. He wants to take you down. By the way, the book's not closed on who's getting baptized at the end of the month. So if you think maybe you'd like to talk about getting baptized, come and speak to me. It's not too late to uh, add in another person or two, isn't it, Danny? Or another service, even. But if we are trusting in Jesus, and if we are believing that he's with us when we gather together, surely that should show itself in a vitality, a life in our worship. Worship, after all, is an attitude of our hearts. And so what we do on the outside should reflect what's happening inside, and that should inform our whole lives. Not just for an hour on a Sunday morning, but it should also show itself in a passion for God being above everything else in our life. But dear old Thomas, absent Thomas, missed all that. He missed all the excitement. For whatever reason, he just wasn't there. Was it an excuse or was it a reason? Maybe he had valid reasons. Maybe he was busy, otherwise occupied. Maybe he had a headache. Maybe there was a big match that day between Jerusalem City and Antioch Rovers. (laughs) Maybe it was date night with Mrs. Thomas. Maybe he missed the bus or the camel train. Whatever the reason, he missed out. And he missed out on the moment in history when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords revealed to his closest group of friends that he'd risen from the grave. That was a bad night to miss Thomas. Needless to say, the next time the disciples catch up with him, they're gushing with excitement. Thomas, guess what? You'll never believe it. Well, they were right there. We've seen Jesus and he's alive. Which 
brings us to Thomas' second nickname, the one that we all know, Doubting Thomas. Put yourself in his shoes or sandals for a moment. Think of the weekend you've just had. Your master, the one that you've given up everything to follow, has been hung up to die a criminal's death on a wooden cross, exposed to public ridicule and taunts and spit and bile. All your dreams lie in tatters. What are you going to do with your life now, Thomas? You've spent the last three years giving it all up for this man, and now what? And you've spent the last few days weighing it all up and trying to make sense of it all. And now, now these guys that you've walked with these last three years, they're all telling you this most incredible story. Seems too good to be true. And it's a bit hard to swallow, really, isn't it, Thomas? And so when we read his reaction to the disciples in verse 25, we see a very honest human reaction, which may well have been the reaction of all of us, if we are honest, if we had been in his place. Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, unless I put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, before we judge Thomas too harshly, let's just think about our own selves because I think we can all be like that at times. When we hear stories of how God has impacted someone's life, someone claims to have been healed supernaturally, someone claims that they heard the voice of God, someone claims that they had a vision of Jesus, someone says, someone claims... And our default response is one of skepticism, one of doubt. We are all Thomas-esque. And it's maybe an unfortunate twist of history that Thomas is the one of the disciples whose nickname stuck. We don't talk about Peter as Rocky or denying Peter. We don't talk about ambitious James Although these would just have been as much deserved as doubting Thomas. But there's one more nickname which Thomas could have acquired. Which lets us see him 2,000 years later in a, a much more positive light. From failure to faith, Thomas goes from being absent Thomas and doubting Thomas to being believing Thomas. Because a week has passed... And the disciples are together again. And this time Thomas is with them. And then it happens. Jesus appears before them again. By the way, did you notice the little detail that he appears before them even though all the doors were locked? How'd that happen? Can you imagine the scene though? All the other disciples' eyes when Jesus appears may have turned to Thomas to gauge his reaction when he sees the risen Lord Jesus, just like they had seen him a week, a week before. See, we told you, they might have said. But it's actually Jesus that speaks first. Peace be with you. And then he addresses Thomas. He singles Thomas out and he speaks to him alone. And he says, put your finger here. See my hands, reach out your hand, put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Isn't that typical of Jesus? That he sees Thomas' need and moves to address it straight away. And when we place ourselves in a position to meet with Jesus, he wants to bless us. He wants to equip us. He wants to build up our faith. Now, there's no indication that Thomas ever took Jesus up on his invitation to reach into his side with his hand Instead, we read that Thomas believed and confessed that Jesus was his Lord and his God. Thomas was present. He met with Jesus and he believed. And isn't that what we all desire for church and for ourselves? That we will meet with Jesus. I don't know why you came this morning. I don't know why you came to church. Was it out of habit? Curiosity? I like, do you like a good sing song? That's fine. But the primary reason for being here, I hope, 
is to meet with the risen Jesus. It's to know that there's a God who is alive, who loves you, whose son was crucified on a cross to take your sins away, and that there's a way that you can live. You know that phrase that you hear everywhere, live your best life? You didn't experience that until you've met Jesus. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life, and life in all its fullness. Whatever you've done with your life up to this point, it will pale into significance. The things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Our desire should be that he will meet with us, that he will gently grow our belief in him as we experience him, as we encounter him. Shortly after these events with the disciples and, and Thomas's confession and newly restored belief, Jesus would go and return to heaven six or so weeks later. And he went with the promise that he was coming back, that he would return one day to take his believers to be with him. And that's what we who are Christians are waiting for this morning. But importantly, vitally actually, Jesus hasn't just left us alone to get on with it until he comes back. Not long before he died, he was explaining this to his disciples, and you can read of it in John chapter 14, where he just says this, Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, but believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back. And I'll take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going? And then our friend Thomas pipes up. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, he says to Thomas, if you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And further on, down that same chapter, in verse 26, Jesus continues and he says, the, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Jesus has sent one just like himself, namely the Holy Spirit, to be a helper, an encourager, a comforter, an advocate, one who comes alongside us and enables us to live God, live to God's glory and by his spirit until the day when we die or when Jesus returns. Let me address you this morning, because I, I don't know many of you, not really. Some of you have never met. Some of you have yet to shake hands with. So I don't know where you are this morning in this. I don't know what nickname would be most appropriate for you. Would you be like absent Thomas? Missing out on the exciting things that God has for you? Because you're simply not around when God's people gather together. Or would you be more like doubting Thomas? Quite simply, the evidence you've seen just doesn't add up. It doesn't give you that conclusive proof that Jesus is who he claims to be, the Son of God. Or would you be more like believing, Thomas, with your eyes having been opened to the claims of Jesus? And just like Thomas, you realize that he did die on the cross for the sins of the world, that he did rise again from the dead, that he came for you to take your sin and that that certainty gives you a real sense of hope in this life and the next. And so you're just bursting to serve him with your life. Finally, a word to all of us. How can we be intentional about experiencing the presence of God when we gather together? Very quickly, three things. First of all, be there. Be there. Show up. Show up faithfully. Make church a priority. There will always be other options to choose from. Demonstrate to God that he has number one position in your heart. Don't be a part of the body which is remote from all the other parts. That makes no sense. And actually, anatomically, it doesn't work. 
I don't think Thomas would have missed many more gatherings, would he? One was enough. Be there. Secondly, be committed. Your brothers and sisters in God's family need you. And you need them. And if you look around the room this morning without any disrespect at all, you might not feel that you have much else in common with some of your Christian brothers and sisters in the room today. But we have Christ in common. And Christ is enough. We sang earlier. Be there, be committed. Finally, be expectant. When we come together, expect God to be here. Take Jesus at his word. And as you worship God, expect to hear from him. Be there, be committed, be expectant. And if we are here, and if we are committed to Christ and to one another, and we're expecting the presence of the risen Lord Jesus amongst us, then we will go forward as a community of faithful people, obedient to God, obedient to his word, worshipping, caring, and growing. One final nickname. We read in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, that these early believers got a nickname for themselves in a place called Antioch, where it says the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. If you're a Christian this morning, if you're a believer in Jesus, you are following in a 2,000-year tradition of having the nickname Christian. Wear it with pride. Acknowledging that Jesus is Lord. Our friends who are being baptised in a few weeks, they will demonstrate on the outside what has happened and is happening to them on the inside, that Jesus is Lord, that their old life is in the past and that they're now living free, free because of Jesus. Jesus said, by this all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. So let's do it. Let's be authentic believers in Jesus. Not absent, not doubting, but believing. Amen. Our closing song expresses a certainty that we can bring our doubts, that we can bring our uncertainties, and when we expose them before Jesus, we will have them dealt with, and we will have them replaced with a certainty and a belief, an unshakable faith in one who's reliable, dependable, and true, the one who is our cornerstone. So let's stand if we're able and sing of our security in Jesus, cornerstone.
Thank you, Gordon, for bringing us God's word this morning. Um, I've always liked Thomas. I've liked the fact that he's honest and he's straightforward and he says, I, I doubt it. I never knew that Didymus meant twin and not being small, so I'm quite <laughs> glad about that. Um, I've got a twin and not to name any names. Um, somebody says to me, if Jesus would come down, I'll believe it. If I'd seen myself, I'd believe it. Well, I'm one of many people here who can say, I believe it because I've met him in my heart. 24 years ago, I met him in my heart. I know that he's alive. He's risen from the grave. 1,000%. And this week, me and Gordon are going to interview Trevor about his testimony uh, and to record it. And I know that at the age of 16, Trevor met Jesus and his life was transformed. I won't say you age now, Trevor, but he's not 16 anymore. That's what God does. He transforms lives. And if you've got doubts and you think, I'm not sure, that's okay. Can I encourage you to take a Bible? We give them away for free and read the book of John for yourself and say, Jesus, if you're real, I want to meet you. And I guarantee if you mean it with your heart, you'll meet him. He'll speak to you. And if you think, yes, I want some of that, please speak to Gordon after the service and say, I want some help. I want some guidance. We've got a prayer zone over there. If you need prayer for something, that's what it's there for. If you've been struggling with something, um, pray. There's people on the prayer zone. It's not me today, I'm pretty sure. If it is, Rob will tell me. But seriously, when we respond to God and say, I need help, I need more, God answers. When we call to him, he answers. If you'd like to know more, please speak to Gordon. He'll be in his, he's going to come pray in a second. But... We believe he can heal, he can transform because he's risen from the grave, yeah. because he's alive. And we're, we're a small church of many churches around the world. I've been sending somebody videos at silly clock in the morning every day this week. Um, and I love the Hillsong videos, but there's a full stadium of people worshipping God. We're one small church of thousands of churches and millions of people around the world that can say, yes, Jesus is alive and he's transformed my life. Please stay for tea and coffee. Gordon's going to pray. That's, that's, I just wanted to point the old wicked every song where you've shown me this morning, this week. And it oh. has been amazing. Thank you. He, he, he replies and says, Good morning. I say, I'm going to the toilet and going back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pray together. More of a benediction than a prayer, but a statement of intent this morning that we may not have seen the risen Christ with our eyes, but we see him yes. in the lives of those who have been transformed by his grace. We may not have met Jesus face to face, but we've seen him in the faces of everyone whose love encourages us. We may not have touched the wounds from the cross, but we have been called to bring healing to the scarred of the world. So let us now agree to go and serve the Savior, not absent, but present, not doubting, but believing. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Thanks for being with us today.